We are going to follow on today from what I introduced last week, which was a metaphor for getting somebody on board the idea that no matter what age, no matter what our health status, no matter what our comorbidity, we are alive, we are breathing, and we can adapt. And can anybody, can anybody pump into the box here what the metaphor that last week's session was all about? What was the metaphor for, for the session? General adapted adaptation syndrome. Yes, it was about adaptation, but there was a key paper that I gave you guys. There was a video that I shared from our self-management program around a particular metaphor for when you're trying to expand something. What was that? Envelope of function. Beautiful. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully that was helpful for you guys as a concept because we're gonna be building on that today. Please fire in any questions um, that you want to, but what I'm using is the next, I've got about seven sessions, I think, with you guys um, over the next term and maybe even after, afterwards, so we've got time. This session is my general principles session for load management and persistent pain presentations in limbs. So. There's, it's going to probably, it's a two hour, two hour session that I, that I teach that primes the program construction afterwards. Um, so it's going to be general principles in this session and leading on to next session um, that we're going to cover, that we're going to cover all of those. And I'm going to upload the PDFs into um, Blackboard for you, but I make these, I make these um, on, on Google Drive so I can embed videos and resources to bring them to life so that there's much more depth to them and my teaching is still embedded in there. So I'm going to try and share that on a screen share to, through this session so that I can play some of those videos for you um, to, because I, I think they're helpful learning resources. So what um just get this up here what may happen is if because i'm i'm doing this now on a chrome tab share i'm actually going to be looking on that so i can change the slides on there so if my slides off or whatever disappear off this screen please don't just sit in silence i can hear the, the messages coming into the box um tell me luke slides disappeared and i can and I can get them back on. So the concepts here are going to be maybe born out of maybe born out of um, some of the tendinopathy research because those tend to be presentations that will be frustrating and difficult to manage, especially for the patients who will want to be fixed and a quick fix because that won't happen with these. Um, so we need to be able to we need to be able to work with that and get to the general principles and guidelines that we can construct and work with our patients that we will then be able to adapt and individualize to our patient. And loading is going to be important. Okay, that is something that we are going to be working through because without load, we don't have stimulus, we don't have the input required for adaptation, which is what really we set the scene for last session when we went through this when we went through this concept of, of envelope of function. And here, I'm not going to play this video here on the right, but that is the shortened version that I put into my reporter findings with a patient. So I will try and get the envelope of function section into my reporter findings, individualizing to all of their activities in painting it. I invited you guys to send me your versions of that. That invitation still stands. Um, that video that's what that video is there and this these images here are just illustrations of you know the adaptability of the human body these are images that i took when i was in nepal last year at everest base camp and this this chap here he was in his 50s and you know this is how they get 
goods to the villages in the mountains there at high altitude where they don't have roads, they don't have any other means. So what is, what is left as their option? They're forced to have to be able to carry things. So, you know, I've got, I've, I've got had a go with this strap that goes over your head and then it wraps around the bottom of whatever you're carrying. And that's going to be as awkward a, an item, you know, this, these gas, these gas, um, bottles that I've got there you know my load there was about 85 kilo, 85 to 90 kilograms this gentleman here who's carrying these planks of wood with his bags etc on top is about 120 kilograms and you know these people have this the most have, are demonstrations of some of the most extraordinary levels of adaptability you know look at the the axial load through the through the head inflection they happen to be stooped over this little stick is what they use to be able to break and then sit on and they are living breathing examples of you know if we were to scan them we'd probably see that they'd their bodies would have adapted and deformed in certain ways to the stresses that's been put on them but what's happened for to their envelope of function it has expanded to be able to do extraordinary things um i'm also going to play this video here to be able to illustrate you know we can see this in the spine but let's look at the an example of the joint just play this video here to illustrate the ankle the, how the ankle has adapted I'm filming this for our students to show Play that again in case you were, weren't able to see it. Yeah. Uh, look at the pronation. I'm this for our students to show. Through his ankles, got about 80 kilograms that he's carrying on his back there. The most high tech, up to date shoes on the market. Um, and an amazing. I did this last time I lost off the screen. An amazing demonstration of how the human body can and will adapt if we ask it the question to. And I, you know, I, I had a little look at the the research on on back pain and, uh, and and injuries over in Nepal and Kathmandu area when I was over there. And there was, you know, there's no high, there's not higher reported rates of back pain there, but then there's also much lower access to healthcare for them to report it. So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a conflict and a bias there, but really the message that I took from that, what I was inspired by was this idea of envelope of function that we talked about last week. You know, this is, this illustrates that people, seldom can people not adapt to what they want to and need to be able to do if we expose them to in a way that allows their body to adapt. So I think there's, um, I think there's a really powerful message in there, hence I, hence I put it into our lectures. So bringing it back into probably a little bit more uh, reflective of, of, of our culture and our society is the presentations of where somebody is going to exceed their envelope of function and lead to them coming to us because they've got Achilles pain, because they've got knee pain, because they've got you know, gluteal ischial pain. And that's going to be, you know, for a real in-depth dive on, on tendinopathy, you know, I direct you to go to Pete Maliaris and Ebony Rio, and there's, there's people out there who have spent, you know, their entire, their entire focus is around going in to look at all the literature around biomechanics and all of these things, which is really, really blurry when you look, when you look at, um, why somebody would have a, a sore knee or a, sea ankle, a sore ankle. You know, look at that video we just saw in Nepal there. People will adapt if the rate of change allows them to. Why, what will lead to somebody having a pain presentation coming to us is that they will have exceeded their envelope of function somewhere along the line. And it'll often be in some surprising places that until, until, you, until you reflect and you look at where they might be in a diary format, 
it, it can it can look like oh yeah maybe it's just my posture it's the way I'm walking or it's something that is probably innocuous you know has somebody started in their in their pursuit to get fit and healthy started doing a, a couch to 5k it's an example that I use to be able to uh, put on my envelope of function presentation uh, last week but that would be an example of someone exceeding their capacity because they haven't done exercise for years and then all of a sudden they've got that motivation to be able to run 5k and they've got a local park run and now they're running five times a week for 20 minutes which maybe to somebody else doesn't seem like much but to their tissues in their shins to their ankles to their knees it's exceeded their capacity to be able to adapt maybe they're an athlete and they've just started doing much more hill work maybe they're an athlete and they've got a high envelope of function but they've just had an off season where they had three or four months and then they're coming back in and their envelope like the astronaut that goes into space has shrunk in that time it needs to be given that break in to be able to expand back out so they could be you know not it could be just that you've had a a reduction in your in your loading for a short period of time has has someone changed their footwear there was you know there, there was a big there was a big um trend about 10 years ago towards barefoot and that was something that i i was real passionate about at the time to you know it made sense that the foot has got 33 joints and they all need to be moving and we, our shoes are too restrictive and i slowly adapted to some barefoot shoes with all my shoes were barefoot and i did that for about seven years and then for, for some reason or another i i think i got bought a pair of trainers by my parents actually and it was just an asics more restrictive typical trainer one that i wear today um and i wore them for for three or four months and then went back to my barefoot shoes which i'd worn for 10 years and I had the most crippling feet pain in the in the ten, tenders of the extensors of my big toe that I could no longer, it took me seven years to be able to adapt to barefoot. It took me three months to adapt out of it. You know, so what, what just an ex, a, you know, demonstration of how the body and these changes in somebody's loading may be hiding if we can, if we can unearth it. If we move on to the upper limb, you know, those are going to be things that are going to present to us in the lower limb. For the upper limb, people are significantly more likely to be presenting with shoulder pain if they're spending time overhead. So in their job, where has, you know, where has, has there been some change in their job where they're all of a sudden painting high or they're having to, you know, be overhead more than often? Have they just got a dog? Is there some sudden increase in throwing that they may be not not accustomed to and that has is how they've expand, exceeded their envelope of function you are significantly higher uh, more likely to see hairdressers painters who work overhead coming in with you know subacromial pain syndrome or something in the shoulder hurts so being able to being able to spot that and being able to see where those changes have taken place is going to be important because from an evolutionary evolutionary perspective this is on the left here this barrel shaped torso is our torso and this triangular one is a chimpanzee or a monkey you know the anatomy or the biomechanics of this you know this triangular one is primed for the shoulder blade to be oriented better for being overhead that is just the the way that a monkey's anatomy and shoulder is has evolved is designed for breakating and for being overhead whereas the angle of ours enables us to be able to get this rotation to throw in a way that monkeys are not able to do but again is that a situation where evolution has even evolution has failed us I like to try and get across to my patients that it's probably much more a case of the rate of change. We are able to tolerate these things, things like the Nepalese chat, if we ask our body to over a period of time. May not be able to now for whatever reason, but you know, I think as
sorry. Um, so yeah, I just I wanted to be able to play that just to be able to illustrate again. I think that the message that we need to be getting across, thanks, Kelsey, is that no movements are bad. The no movements are off. Maybe some are off now, but if if they are off now, we are going to be bringing those back in, and that's I think. I think that's a really important message that it's, again, even though we're not maybe designed like a monkey to be overhead, people who are overhead and they have to be overhead because their job is overhead, you know, we can adapt and we can get to that point where we can do that without that being a problem. Some systemic factors that will lead to us, uh, lead to the tendon losing its capacity to tolerate load will be, some things will be not modifiable. So our age that is something that we can't do anything about but we are able to do other things that will mitigate the impact of the inevitable degeneration that we all go through for, at the age of 70 compared to when we are 30 okay and those are going to be the things that are on there that are going to be your lifestyle behaviors things like your weight management things like smoking things like you know the, your diet and your cholesterol all of these factors have an impact on the metabolic health of our connective tissues and our tendons and really offset the impact of aging and we can make ourselves biologically younger if we take up exercise at a, late, a later point in age than, um, um, than otherwise we would be. And these are things that impact our ability to be able to tolerate load, which could then exceed our envelope function and could give us pain, which is the alarm metaphor that I have introduced there and you guys should hopefully be familiar with and developing your confidence confidence in getting that across as a message because we spent the entirety of last term in giving you the vehicles for being able to get that across okay so into movements and movements that will become a problem and a consistent problem not in and of themselves but after the tissue is pissed off and the first one that you'll hear if you look at and talk about people who have got a tendinopathy, for example, tendinopathy being the pain presentation that comes in a tendon and is lost its, you know, it's become um, sensitive and irritable to load will be compressive load. And compression gets a bad rap then as if to say that compression is a bad thing. Now, again, just like um what we've been hopefully the theme of what we're going through is it, it's neither a good or bad thing but at this point in time it may be a problem so this is an ultrasound image i've pulled from pete maliaris and this is the bone here of the achilles uh, the bone of the um calcaneus the, that the achilles is attaching to and this is the this is the achilles and this is the enthesis which is where it merges the connective tissue is all made of the same ground substance but it changes you know somewhere it blurs from bone here through to tendon through to muscle up here and this enthesis is a bit more like a fibro cartilage type material and if we imagine taking this ankle now into dorsiflexion so full full dorsiflexion the underside or this this tendon is going to be drawn tight against your heel and this underside of the tendon here is going to become compressed okay and that is going to be a consistent theme through the tendons as a provocative movement is going to be the compression so being aware of what the compressive movement of the achilles would be is a helpful is a helpful because you're going to use that as your starting point when we get to the second lecture in here you know Achilles dorsiflexion, deep dorsiflexion is going to be provocative. In the knee, in patella, it's going to be knee flexion. So once you get down to about 90 degrees um, at the knee and then deeper, you're going to be causing a lot of compression on the underside of the patella tendon against, against your anatomy that is going to be provocative. In the, in the hamstring, it's going to be the proximal hamstring we're talking here which is going to be as it inserts on the ischial tuberosity the compressive movement for that will be hip flexion so imagine doing a hip hinge that is going to be a problem in compressing the underside 
of a hamstring tendon. In a glute medius, which will present to you as um, maybe lateral glute or hip pain, that is going to be compressed if you take that hip into adduction. It's going to be compressed in the underside of that tendon. And from a rotator cuff perspective, like we talked about going overhead, it's going to be elevation. So it will be elevation in this plane, elevation in this plane. It's going to be overhead and resisted external rotation that is going to be compressing the rotator cuff underneath the chromium. And when we get to the shoulder, we're going to see that there's a lot more factors than just the loading of the, of the connective tissue. It's much more like back and neck rehab with the shoulder. But knowing these is going to be really helpful for you as, as a thinking process for what movements we are going to be testing and maybe load managing to take out for a while. And again, just to, as a reiteration, what I'm saying here is that my, I've had a patella tendinopathy where I've had to take knee flexion out for a period of time and got to get across to my patients that knee flexion is not a problem. My knee is just sensitized to it at the moment. It will get back to being able to tolerate, for example, this movement here, which is a deep knee flexion under load. A lot of compression, compression going on in the patella tendon in a movement like this. Not a bad thing, but when the tendon's pissed off, maybe it's not something that we are tolerant of at the moment. So compression is, is, is one thing, and knowing the movements that cause compression is going to be really helpful. The next thing is going to be high and fast load, and that and there is really important because just having high load through connective tissue doesn't really tell us that much. And how do we see that? This is stuff again I've pulled from Pete Maliaro's work. Is you know this is a this is a calf press on a machine, which is a heavy um, heavy press here compared to a hop. So the same movement, but one done under heavy load, very slow. One movement done very fast because it's a it's a it's a rebound plyometric activity, and the loading rate on a slow press is. 0.7 body weights per second compared to on the hop is a loading rate which is you know the hop has got less external resistance there's not any weight apart from body weight but the loading rate at the achilles is 15 body weights per second an enormous an enormous increase in the load through the tendon because of the speed of the movement and we'll see that, and if we bring that back to the things that, that we sort of start where the rate of change will have happened somewhere, it will be, you know, are you going uphill more? Are you, are you, have you picked an event where now you're running more? Have you changed your footwear? There will be the, the plyometric, the rebound, high and fast loaders, that, what this is called, will be what has sensitized somebody. Really, really helpful to be able to see that because just high load itself is not going to tell you anything. We can see that even better in the patella here, where we've got someone doing a loaded squat. We can see somebody doing a loaded squat with um, it's about 80 kilos or something to, into, into knee flexion, and someone doing a landing horizontal jump onto single leg. Okay, so here we've got the strain on the tendon in the squat is five to 10% in the patella tendon. The strain on the tendon is also five to 10% on the horizontal deceleration landing but the loading rate in the squat is one to two body weights per second through knee flexion the loading rate on a horizontal landing single leg is 38 body weights per second an enormous step up in load based on the loading rate and just anecdotally speaking from my experience if I, well, if I was coming to you when I had my knee which has been a real problem for me for the last 12 months it was a lingering it was a lingering case where i was exceeded i'd exceeded my ability to adapt for a while but then one event running fell running downhill uh, actually penavan if any of you are familiar and have been there i legged it from the top down to the bottom as fast as i can and if you would imagine every single one of those would be like a horizontal deceleration like this in the patella and by the time i got to the bottom my knee was sore by the next day i couldn't wait better as if I'd broken my leg. So that makes sense 
when we appreciate the loading rate of plyometric high and fast load is so much more important than just high load. High load is actually going to be the medication. And the way we get started with a lot of these is slow, heavy, slow resistance. And we will probably have to take out the, the high load and then bring that back in. This is just an image of the shoulder to illustrate that when someone's pitching a baseball, um, the, the rate or the angles of that the shoulder is passing through in a pitch is 170 kilometers per hour. You know, that is an enormous speed and an, obviously an enormous loading rate that is passing through the shoulder in something like throwing. And something that's missed a lot with the shoulder is the fact that if our glute foot, if the entire kinetic chain is not pulling its, pulling its weight with producing the speed that eventually ends up in the hand, then we are gonna probably end up and wind up seeing a shoulder that has become provoked and irritated. Um, so again, throwing is going to be high and fast load in the in the upper limb. So neither compression or high or high and fast load are a problem in and of themselves. But when we then if we marry that up with they've exceeded the capacity to be able to adapt, those two things are going to be a problem, and those things are going to be what we're going to need to take out for a period of time to be able to rehabilitate somebody to be able to eventually tolerate it. And that's what, this is, this is what that will look like on a little schematic that I have created with Pete Maliaris, um, where someone comes and they are intolerant of a stretch shortening cycle. Well, that's a high load. A stretch shortening cycle is the rebound, the, the, the use of elasticity to be able to propel a following contraction cycle which is ultimately plyometric running all of these all of these high high plyometric loads so we would need to take that down and out so running jumping those things we need to either significantly reduce or stop and then we would play with tempo to do heavy slow resistance from the start of rehab that will run all the way through and arguably on indefinitely whilst we then incrementally bring back in either compression or high and fast load that we have taken out. And we've got some frameworks and some guidelines around how that would happen to get us to the point where we can expand our envelope of function to return to work, return to sport at a point higher than what was previously outside our envelope of function and led to our tissues becoming, becoming sensitized, painful, and ultimately then deconditioned. So that then takes us into the into the, the fuzzy world of where does pain fit in with tendons and in these specific, in these peripheral joints because the, the way we will the way we will diagnose a tendon that's painful is that it will be local pain specific to loading it that has become painful so you need to find a way and incrementally load up the Achilles car phrase and various forms of it, patella, squat and various forms of it, ha hamstring, uh, hip hinge and various forms of it and then incrementally at faster speeds. But when we load that specific tissue, it hurts. And that could be defined as allodynia because allodynia is a painful response to something that shouldn't be painful. Okay, it will be painful on tenderness and it will then have a really nice relationship with the loading, you stop the loading and it doesn't hurt. You know, if I was to you know, describe to you my patella tendinopathy, really hurt the point, load intolerant, couldn't stand up when I made it so flared up um, to any contraction of my patella tendon. But as long as I'm not, I'm not weight bearing on it, I don't have pain. You know, I don't have, an, I don't have a, a generalized sensitized system. It will be provoked by compression and high and fast load of that tendon. Okay, so that's a nice, relate, nice linear relationship that we can that we can sometimes see. Unfortunately, for some people, it just doesn't work that way, and we get a we don't get a nice local pain. We get a spread in pain. So it starts off maybe at the patella at the patella pole, but then it becomes a diffuse knee pain, 
it starts moving to different body parts. You know, but then we have, you know, we load it, we walk, we do a little bit of, a, a, of, a, of an activity that flares it, and it flares for weeks, sometimes even months. You know, that is where we have a irritable presentation and that is the, those are the ones that are really difficult and this because this is this is where we would look at that and try and find the driver of the pain this is from jeremy lewis where we've got you know peripheral and central sensitization i've taken you guys through how we deliver that all last term you know we've got the tissues in the rotator cuff we've got bursa we've got you know classic diagnoses like a frozen shoulder or a you know degeneration we've got psychosocial factors what is driving the pain experience that we're seeing here it's probably this mesh that we see over on the right hand side that we need to unpick and unravel to be able to to work with that person and in an, in an irritable in an irritable presentation it's going to be looking much more like pain management and less about loading especially until we can get that get under control and normalize pain so that we can engage with a little bit of it Scanning, scanning for tendons and for pain in the back is not any more effective in the limbs. It's a bit, again, it's a bit blurry when it comes to, to tendons. The main way that people are going to scan tendons are going to be ultrasound, and you can see degeneration, you can see inflammation. It's a bit of a, it's both seem to be a factor in this, why we call it tendinopathy rather than tendonitis. People who don't have those changes don't seem to have pain in the tendon but the, cab the, the flip of that is that you can have those changes in a tendon and not have pain so we have to treat the man not the scan clinically and um and that is that is going to be equally important if you're working with the back or if you're working with the tendon just a scan with a tendon can show you know i don't i don't scan them but i know the peak maliaris for example would scan most tendons because you can then see when you load the tendon that it has regenerated, but that can take a year, two years, even more to be able to see those morphological changes. Not required to change someone's pain, that is that is clear. So what we're gonna be working through now for the, for the remainder of this session is the sensitivity of musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal presentations like the ankle, knee, shoulder, because there does seem to be an equally important sensitivity component to, um, to, to, to neck and back pain as we've been going through. Just will be maybe a more clear loading component that we're gonna be going through next session. So there is some fancy quantitative measures that you can use to be able to test thresholds. And this paper here basically shows that we can get a similar, similar response by using much more lower, uh, lower access tools like an ice cube for temperature to be able to, to measure that. And I'm gonna play a couple of these to remind you guys how you might test with your patients for sensitivity in a body part, because some of you will have seen the lecture that I did on this in the first term, some of you wouldn't have, and if you did see it, I want you to remind it, watch this again, for how we get from our patient that that body part might be a bit more sensitive. So I'm going to play just a couple of a couple of these, and then we will then we will move on. But you have got access to all of these on Blackboard because I put them on there. similar test but I'm going to use sharp so can you feel this here? Yeah, sharp. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay though? Yeah. Okay, so same routine. First of all, I'm going to go on this side of this knee. What are you feeling there? So it's sharp. Yeah, yeah, okay, so that's normal. And then down here? Yeah, sharp. Okay, so we'll just go to the other other side. Yeah, that's, that's not good. Yeah? Yeah. Um, that's so it's different to the other side again? It is. It's different, yeah. And um, um, where are you feeling that when I do that? So I can feel it where you're touching, but I can also feel it in that spot where it goes down my leg. Oh, well. so that's reproducing that yeah. pain down your leg. Yeah. And, and so you would describe that as more painful when I put this on down the knee there. Yeah. And um, lower down. That's not 
comfortable down there on that So that's side. different to that side? Yeah. Does yeah. it spread there or is it just no. where I'm doing that? Just where the two things touch the skin. Okay, so that's a bit like the, the light touch one that we did as well, isn't it? So a little yeah. sensitive? Yeah, that one was worse. Yeah. yeah. Any thoughts on what that means yet? Uh, seems to be more sensitive on the yeah. outside than the back. That's a fair comment. So being able to use, use simple testing for sensitivity and also what I wanted you to again tune in there to is, uh, is, is the communication around trying to get that from our patients. So that is, that's tapping into motivational interviewing techniques of you know, getting the person on board the idea themselves. What's going on there? That does seem to be more, clearly more sensitive when you do hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia is a response to... It's an it's it's a enhanced response to something that would be noxious. So we use a pin prick to test, as you guys all do in your neurological neurological assessment. And the idea is that someone can report that as sharp, noxious. And if you do that in different body parts, you know, is it being processed as more noxious on one body part than the other? What does that mean to you? Opens up to help us to be able to help them with otherwise more complex more complex issues because just we're going to just touch on it in a second treating these irritable ones like this just a loading issue is going to set them up to failure and that's going to be a big problem i'm going to play one more um which i think is going to be a nice one just to review and that's going to be the um the thermal one for you doing thermal sensitivity instructions on the left here for you to be able to to use to guide your communication around this Okay, Jenny, is that settled back down after that last bit of testing? Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. so now we're going to try um, your response to cold. Mm -hmm. So I just want to try this on your hand first. Are you feeling that? Yeah, I can feel that. And what do you feel there? Just cold. Yeah, yeah. not uncomfortable, painful. So just on this knee, what are you feeling there? Just cold, yeah. Similar to my hand. Same, not painful or uncomfortable. Okay, so now I'm going to go to this knee. You ready? Yeah. So I'm just going to hold oh, that. That's, yeah, that's really uncomfortable. That is? And where are you feeling that? Um, oh, all that, that whole area under my knee. Kind of feel the pain down my leg. Spreading the pain down yeah. your leg. Um, I've taken it off now. What's happening? It still feels like it's on there. Yeah. yeah. I'll just give it a few moments. Yeah. Sometimes the last one can linger for a little while. Does it feel like it's settling now? It's less. It's not gone, but it's less. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll just give it a bit more time yeah. and I'll, I think that will settle. So there's a little battery of tests that you can do to be able to build up your clinical picture of is this an irritable or sensitized presentation, light touch sensitivity, sharp sensitivity, cold and deep pressure. And you know you can do one or two of them if you're time pressed. If you can do all four, then it gives a clearer, clearer picture. And that could be helpful in getting somebody on board and get building up your idea around whether there is sensitivity at play here or not. If you're able to do those tests, you could do those tests before and after a single bout of acts of exercise and activity to see if they are, you know, to see how sensitive they are to exercise. So the rice paper that we went through is where we looked at the impact of descending inhibition on people who don't have don't have pain and people who have various pain groups to be able to see, you know, if I pull this up here, that, you know, whether we do a treadmill, whether we do resistance training, a cycle ergometer, if you're able to do like that ice cube chest or the high test or hyperalgesia on the painful body part and then on a the distal body part, we can start to see the, you know, the, how, how dysfunctional somebody's internal vocabulary in their brain is. And that is something that we want to be able to ensure that we can communicate because if we don't, then people will interpret that this exercise or this movement is 
damaging, causing my knee a problem, where okay, they may be not, they may be not ready to tolerate it yet, but maybe we can exercise dif distal body parts to be able to stimulate this internal drug cabinet in the brain that um, certain exercise protocols have shown, and I've got them all in here for you to be able to look at. You know, they they can can be beneficial in the general exercise prescription. This is not going to be specific. You know, you've, maybe you've got someone coming to you with patella, an irritable patella, but doing upper body training stimulates the internal drug tablet descending inhibition to give them benefits in their knee without even exercising their knee. Well, you know, being able to communicate that to our to our patients could be really important in the buy-in in adhering with the program and being able to actually desensitize their system because as you said, exercising their knee at the moment may not be what they're able to tolerate. So this is, I've embedded this video here, but this is basically the calming nerves, pain neuroscience education that I took you guys through, where I demonstrate how I explain to patients this research to normalize flare-ups and get this across to be able to, to, to be able to get the benefits that we just talked about today. Pain neuroscience education, that is for, for you, you guys, you've been through that with me to be able to, to be developing. It is, there is case cause for optimism around sensitization that it is something that we can reverse. Not everybody and not all the time to to, 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 to different extents, but it is a process that can be reversed and that's what this paper here is ultimately saying all, all of this that we're talking about gives us optimism for our patients to work through a program and and give them hope for adherence to be able to to work through what would otherwise be perceived as a failure this bill paper has this glossary that if you're comfortable with with the pain literacy uh, that's small there, but it is going to be uploaded onto Blackboard. You know, things like allodynia, things like hyperalgesia, nociceptive pain, nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain. These things are going to be important for you to be able to build and work with, with these patients to be able to make some of these things make sense. Now, there's some things that are going to be unhelpful strategies for you when you're working with someone who has this with their knee, with their ankle, with their shoulder, just like with the low back. And neck, and that's going to be, you know, this is for you, you can spend more time looking at this afterwards or whenever, maybe not. But managing the presentation that is sensitized, like there is low pain sensitivity, is going to be a problem. Just treating it as, you know, no pain, no pain, no gain, just load it and get stronger. That's going to lead to a more sensitized, heightened pain sensitivity and set people up for failure. In these people, there's going to be a limited role for passive and hands-on care. That is going to not, that doesn't mean to say that we throw the baby out with the bath water and we don't do any manual hands-on care, but it just means that there's gonna be a learning component, there's gonna be an education. They, these things are gonna be more important in pain management than somebody being um, treated maybe just passively. Um, so, but of course, manual care is part of a toolbox that could be delivering a really good program. Blaming pathology is going to be unhelpful. That's what I just talked about on this before on the scan. Uh, when we talk about scans, so if we're looking at also scans, looking at an MRI scan and really pinning all the symptoms on on the image, that's not going to be helpful because again, it's not been shown that you have to get rid of or change the scan to change the pain. And if we don't address beliefs and expectations, then we're never going to be un able to unravel and individualize this patient-centered process. And how have we taken you guys through being able to do that? Your A, B, C, D, E, F, W from Louis Gifford. What do we then do with those beliefs? Well, that's where we use motivational interview and pain neuroscience education to be able to figure out how we're gonna pull up alongside the person to be able to comfort the afflicted or to be able to at what point do we challenge those beliefs afflict the comfortable if somebody is perceiving that they can't get going with this knee because their knee scan shows that they've got degeneration and inflammation in the knee you know we've got to be able to reconceptualize and get this information across that belief will be a, a massive roadblock to being able to to get them going so what has been shown to be helpful 
in working with these people, giving a diagnosis and being able to get the non-specificity of pain, of a non-specific pain diagnosis across, is going to be really important. That is something that we have to be able to do definitively so people don't just interpret that it's a, a, a diagnosis by elimination. That means that we don't really know what's going on. Education and a contemporary evidence-based education is going to be important. You know, we've, I've been talking about using pain neuroscience education and, you know, what, what this is showing here is that there's evidence for the use of pain neuroscience education for MSK pain. It can only be part of a bigger picture. You can't just talk somebody out of pain. It has to be embedded within actually changing, changing people's behaviours and that is really important. Careful pacing to be able to grade the exposure, expand the envelope, general exercise can be really beneficial for a uh, for the descending inhibitions and all the other benefits that we know um, recently made aware by the WHO around exercises, medicine, and all of these all of these things. So, how does that all actually look? Again, me Paul try Paul mainly tries to get people to show what this looks like online, and it's not it's not easy. This link here is our report of findings, which is an hour to try and embed all of this into the process. That is there for you to at least look at and pull from it how and what you see you think is something that you could clinically reason and, and, and agree with or disagree with. That's also fine. Um, but these things are important to build a toolbox that is going to be that is going to be your ability to create that as a process knowledge and education you guys have got so much stuff to be able to support through that exercise and movement unlimited chance to actually be with you in person but being a progressive logical program that is you know patient-centered think about that video last week around how did that gentleman old man work backwards to be able to do his program from um from, from the end goal, you know, relaxation, pacing, great exposure, envelope of function, manual therapy is something that we can do as part of our toolbox for sure. We're skilled, you guys have the benefits of manipulation and other touch-based therapy, you know, massage, these things can be helpful. Goal setting, how did that video to the elderly gentleman make sense to enable him to be able to get and do the program or the journey that that, that video showed the goal at the end was what it was all based on. Okay, certainly to start with. So we've just gone into the murky world of pain and sensitivity because it's a big factor. And it's a big factor because we have to use a pain monitoring model, even with load based, even with what look like primarily load based presentations. And that the program is progressive and that's why being aware yourself around different ways to progress a program is going to be probably more important than the actual program itself that is what is really really clear there's no load in favorite even though we're going to get to for things like the patella things like an achilles there is going to be a load in a type of exercise that loads the achilles better you know a car phrase loads the Achilles better than a bicep curl does. So there's going to be choices of exercise that seem to be important for targeting, targeting them. But when we look at things like within a car phrase, doing negatives, doing isometrics, doing, doing specific types of, of loading there, probably not as important, but we're going to be looking at variables for how we create this over 12 weeks, which is absolutely minimum. You know, realistically, when we're talking about long-term changes in, in connective tissue you're looking much more like six 12 months and even beyond pain monitoring is where things are a little bit gray because we have to establish what acceptable pain is to say is someone low tolerant of that activity and this is where Pete Maliaris and you know this is how Pete Maliaris does this with he's he's probably most established for working with tendons moderate pain so up to six is acceptable. Above that is going to be stop. Um, you can either use the, the numerical scale there or you could use mild and moderate. That again is going to be important 
to the person what makes most sense to them. And if we think about those numbers there and you do an activity, so whether it's a squat, whether it's a set of squats, whether it's walking for a distance, acceptable pain during the activity and pain that is acceptable that it settles within a day to 48 hours. Yeah, Karen, just to, just to give a quick answer to that, this is what this, this is what this slide here illustrates is that you will always have a package of care and within the exercise and movement component, there's going to be a logical and progression, pro progression to that, to the program that hopefully makes sense and can be made harder and can be made easier but all of these factors like understanding manual therapy all of those to different extents for the person in front of you are going to be a part of your treatment treatment package um so absolutely you can't we can't be looking at an exercise regime as in a vacuum and in you know dissociated from from the context from the environment from the beliefs from from all of these from all of these factors so I will use pain neuroscience education to normalize pain. All of the research on these presentations show that we have to be able to work with a little bit of pain, mild to moderate, maybe I would work with my patients, um, and then depending on how irritable they are, we're gonna to get to that when it comes to the shoulder. Um, but that's the pain neuroscience or sensitive alarm system, pain neuroscience education that I use. You could use something, something that you, something else that you're, from, you're, you're more comfortable with, but this is what I've taught and shared with you guys, sharing that tissue damage and pain are not one and the same. Again, we've gone through that through pain neuroscience education. It's on Blackboard for you to be able to use. And that is as far as I'm going to go today because from this point on, is what you're gonna cover next week, is step one of assessing load tolerance. Okay, so we're gonna be getting more into the specifics of the actual exercises for for some of these presentations just to be able to give you a quick whistle stop tour we're going to be looking at load tolerance testing load response how we would be tr trying to get fo function focus normalizing flares that can happen simultaneously how might we track what an exercise looks like on a spreadsheet for load tracking simultaneous adjunctive therapy so where you might use things like manual therapy, shockwave therapy, steroid injection, all of those sorts of things that could be an adjunct for working with low tolerance, reps in reserve, tempo, being able to understand how we can change tempo of movements. This is the framework of the programs that I have made that are not follow alongs, but they're making that progressive scheme that I'm gonna share with you guys to be able to um, to be able to use and to be able to make your own but this paper here and the, the levels of progression is what i'm going to be building on what does that comprise of and then essential management things like um isometrics isotonics high and fast load key things like exercise strength dosages that we can say are evidence-based and we can work to how do we do things like six rep max testing parameters for the different phases of of where somebody's at from a reps sets rest periods all of these things to be able to make a framework of a return to play and then the key loading papers that i have built for you to be able to you know you can have those papers and i will put them on there but they're still just guidelines that we're going to be building upon that uh, Lewis, I don't think you're being tested on this. I think they're putting my stuff in here as mandatory for you to attend, but op but really it's just exercise protocols. You know, you, you, you can have all this stuff for being able to, you know, being, being able to actually learn from it and apply it clinically, but I don't believe that you have exam on it, which may mean that you're not remotely interested. That's okay. That's fine with me. But I would, I would check that maybe with, um, with 
No, I'm definitely interested, yeah. Luke. I just wondered, like, how much of it we actually have to know, like, word for word, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah for sure. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sharing with you my life's work, so I don't think you'd have to... You don't have to get inside my head. It's for you to take and do what you wish as a, as a clinician. My gift to you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, okay, so that's um, that's that's as far as I'm going to take today, and um, we'll be starting from step one next week, and then after that, we'll be looking at the, the actual videos that are filmed and things for you to 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 again use, build on, learn, uh, apply, do what you wish.